Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I'm taking over from Ivan, who is uh, the normal uh, compare or chair person of this, uh, these workshops or these webinars, I should say. Um, this is the last of the um, uh, this before Christmas, and we've got uh, Dr. Shari Debetz. Um, excuse Shari, my pronunciation of your name. I'm renowned for mispronouncing almost any name, including my own, um, <laughs> to talk about this really interesting and important topic as algorithms get more and more uh, publicity, emphasis, uh, generating all sorts of uh, fears. The, re the issue is how do humans interact with algorithms? Uh, how do they understand them? Do, have they, uh, can our algorithms supersede uh, humans? So that's the topic of Shari's talk. But before we get into the, the substance of the afternoon, um, I'd like to talk very briefly about the uh, uh, CMAF, the Centre for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. Have you, as you can see, you, we've got a, a variety of uh, people with a variety of interests uh, from the supply chain, which is possibly the particular area we focused on, uh, including uh, statisticians and uh, two new people joining the, the centre in uh, uh, Anastrognis. Uh, again, a mispronunciation. I'm certainly go not going to attempt uh, Mardi's uh, uh, <coughs> pronunciation of his second name. So the centre then uh, focuses on a wide variety of topics and also offers a, a variety of services, short courses, consultancies, um, particularly MSc projects where our MSc students will work in an organisation on the organisation's problem. Uh, we've been involved with uh, quite in extensively with software developments and, of course, uh, PhD projects. We also have a, a knowledge transfer partnership um, and these are interesting government supported uh, interventions in companies. We've got one going ahead with Jaguar uh, Land Rover at present. So uh, wide expertise, a wide range of services. These webinars have been going on pretty much. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember whether they predate COVID. It's hard to recall, isn't it? Uh, the, the times before COVID. But um, we've now got six planned uh, for uh, the uh, the spring term. That will be a, a nice thing to look forward to. You can see the topics there, a wide ver uh, variety of topics, some technical, but mostly focused on organisational experiences in forecasting, including, for example, uh, some uh, issues concerning machine learning, uh, the Internet of Things from Kai Ho uh, Hoberg uh, from the uh, uh, Kuna School in, uh, in Hamburg. So uh, hopefully you can join us. So you can get the details of this and, and uh, from the, the website, OK? Important to us and I think important to you is just to keep contact with us because we do have uh, also some seminars, uh, a variety of activities that we want to let you know about. We don't interact in extensively, but uh, being part of our LinkedIn community would be one of the easy ways of doing it, but the uh, you can see a variety of ways. So um, keep in contact with us. We'll let you know about the these webinars that are coming up. And it's over to you, Shari, isn't it? OK, um, so when Ivan contacted me to ask if I was interested to present something, um, it was early October. I was just finishing up an experiment for the third time. The first time I made a code error, second time I made a code error, and the third time that was a match. Um, that's what the research is. Um, the thing is that the title that I formulated, um, and this is maybe a bit of a spoiler alert, because the question is, do practitioners trust forecasting algorithms? If you've come here for answers, I'm very sorry. I don't know. Um, 
broadly, we don't know that much. We know a lot, but we haven't come to concrete solutions yet that much. But why would it be important to look at that? So I mainly look at judgmental adjustments of a statistical forecast. So uh, you have a machine, um, a software making a forecast and then the forecaster uh, adjusts this upwards or downwards. Now, this is the most cited um, way of forecasting. So you've got statistics separately, judgment separately, or a combination of both. Uh, it's this combination of both that we see most often in practice. And there is great potential in that collaboration between judgments and statistics because the weaknesses of humans are the strengths of statist statistical models and vice versa. What I mean with that is that, um, and this will cover the dangers as well, is that humans have imperfect reasoning and we suffer from a lot of biases um, and we are not very good at processing a lot of data. That is where the strength of statistics comes in. It can handle large data sets and even larger and even bigger now this year than the year before, which was again better than the year before. So it's rapidly evolving. Now, the danger or the issue with many statistical forecast techniques is that they don't know in the sense that they um, are fed data and they made their they made their decisions based on that data. But as a forecaster, you may, for instance, know that a competing company is about to launch a product that is very similar to your successful product. So that might have an effect on, uh, on the demand and judgment will then compensate for that by pulling down the demand forecast a bit. Because the statistical model only knows what you tell it to. Um, so we're having two parts here that you hear me talk about. We talk about judgment and we talk about statistics. Now the question is, um, how can research on this be so difficult? I mean, it's a piece of cake, right? And now I really want that chocolate cake. Uh, it's an hour later here in Belgium, but um, but there are so many factors that need to be taken into account. It's not just judgment. It's not just statistics. There is a lot of complexity. And um, I announced earlier in a post on LinkedIn that I'll be doing something a bit different. This is not a technical presentation, but um, I had the lovely experience yesterday to talk with someone um, who stated that applied forecasting is ivory tower research, uh, which is a contradiction in terms for, according to me, but and that no progress has been made in the last decades. And I want to show, yes, progress has been made in the sense that things have been ruled out and we have made and we have gained successful insights into empirical data sets, but it is such a complex problem and such a complex world that we measure everything in that it's just not possible to take everything into account. And most of research is not, um, you know, not these big revelations. If you hear a big revelation on uh, read it in the newspaper, it's usually not really true or taken completely out of context. Research is about incremental steps starting at the basics and looking into that. So if we dissect the title a bit, um, I've used all the colors of the rainbow. So human versus machine, do practitioners trust forecasting algorithms? Each element of that seemingly easy or simple question uh, has several sub elements. So if we look at the humans and practitioners, who are we talking about? Are we talking about the actual forecasters, more generalistic data analysts, managers, production, planning, sales and marketing, finance? They all have different ways and for instance, different biases and different um, mistakes that I make in, in adjustment. Um, for I've had the experience to 
work with a fast moving consumer goods company um, and their forecasts, they, they had a specific forecasting team. But what they noticed was when the forecast got handed over to um, the inventory planner, he actually pulled it up a bit. He took the forecast and he made it a little bit more because he never wanted to be out of stock. That was one of his KPIs, no, uh, no stock out. The forecaster team was eventually informed of this. So what did they do? They heightened the forecast so that it would compensate for the lowering of the forecast by the um, inventory control manager, who then again realized that oh, well, the game was played for several months until they came together and said, look, we need to make a distinction between a forecast, between the plan, between the decision. But it's just to say that there is no such thing as the human or the practitioner. Already your sample is very diverse and everyone has their own motivations. If you look at machine, I'm talking about statistical models, but those can be simple or complex. It often depends on the sector or the size of the company. They have a, a dedicated team of analysts who are really good with the models or not. And there I want to note that um, I did a survey with um, about 100, uh, 100 companies and we asked them, do you use simple models or complex models? And they all said complex. And we were a bit surprised by that. Uh, so we followed up and asked, what model do you use? Oh, Holt Winter's regression. Well, if you would say that in academia, that would be one of the simple models. But for the practitioner, a simple model was the naive model, same forecast as last time. And so there is a bit of a difference between what is interpreted as simple and what is interpreted as complex in academia versus the majority of practice. There are outliers, of course. Then it's also the quality of the machine. What do we value most? Do we look at accuracy or usability? Um, and this is one of my, my pet peeves is that having a half percentage improvement in forecasting accuracy, yes, it can mean a lot. It can mean a lot financially, but if it comes at the cost of how much people are using it, it's no longer it's no longer a reason to go for that extra half percent because it will be compensated by for instance, disuse or abuse, like adjusting it too much, because people think for complex models often, if they don't understand it, and they don't know what's going on, that's called the black box effect. And I've heard that being said several times, like, yeah, I just input the data, I press run model, and something comes out of it, but I don't really know what happens, which factors are taken into account. Um, and so I tend to use my own judgment, compare it with the statistical forecast and make an adjustment. And that's, that's what happens a lot. So the question is also in your research, do you stress accuracy? And there are plenty of accuracy measures out there. That's a whole subfield in itself with discussions on the best measure. Or do you focus on, is it still interpretable? Is it still transparent enough that people will want to use it or want to trust it. Why do we mention the word trust? Well, trust is supposed to increase, increased trust means increased intention to use, and it's supposed that intention to use will lead to the actual behavior. A behavior can be use, abuse, or disuse. It can also lead to a certain preference or a certain attitude towards judgment and, or towards models. If I talk about forecasting, what kind of forecasting are we talking about? Demands, sales? Are we talking about planning, which might be something different? Scheduling? Um, is the forecast being made to formulate decisions? What are the implications of the forecast? So management decisions or setting KPIs or setting targets. 
And there the motivational uh, biases come into account because if it's determined for making KPIs, then you would tend to lower your forecast a bit because then it will be easier to actually get that KPI. Um, and then of course there's the word algorithms and what you see a lot in papers um, is the tendency to use all these terms interchangeably, although they are not exactly the same. Some of us say algorithm, some of us talk about the breed, broader field of automation, and there's AI, computer models, statistical models, software. Maybe the terminology has an effect as well, so we need to clear that up as well. So in sum, this is a horrible slide, but it's to show you how many variables there are that need to be investigated before we can provide really a full picture and a full answer to the question, do practitioners trust forecasting algorithms? Uh, we have to think about our sample, about the context, about what we are exactly investigating and what the outcome is. And now I am going to do something that is, I think going a bit against the grain, I'm going to talk to you about studies that I have performed over the last years that did not succeed. Um, it was together with master thesis students of the Open University Netherlands who did their utmost best, but they ran into a lot of specific problems. Um, the first study was in the social sector. So there was this guy who was a social worker and there was a lot of automation and he found, well, maybe there's some sort of um tension between the humanity aspect or the human aspect of the social sector versus the rigidity of automation or algorithms um, and these, his hypothesis was that people from the social sector would like algorithms less so in the pilot that we did, the main feedback that he got is, I do not want to participate because I don't understand the word algorithm. So we brainstormed about that and we came up um, with computer model um, as a sort of replacement. It's not perfect, but it's more understandable. In the actual study, the feedback that we got the most was I will not want to participate because I don't work with computer models. However, they were selected um, by communication with, with management um, as those teams that work with computer models. So there was still some unclarity going on there. And basically it was an awesome thesis that the students wrote up but for every single hypothesis, he had to say not significant, not significant, not enough statistical power. Um, so the terminology is really important to get right. People are scared by the word algorithms. They immediately think of, I don't know, uh, the Google super complex algorithm or something. Um, so there is a bit of, of holding back there, which is the first challenge in this type of research. Then I had someone who was a lawyer and he looked and said, well, lawyers are generally a little bit more risk averse. Um, that might be correlated with the attitudes they have towards al algorithms because algorithms can provide security. Um, he got almost no answers on his survey, but he did get 120 emails. And these were the most common things. It depends, so I don't want to answer the survey. I don't wish to commit to a standpoint without knowing the context. I prefer not to say. Lawyer behavior. So they are very risk averse and they also want to avoid every risk, apparently in an anonymous survey, to commit to one standpoint. Um, and it was actually about preferences, so it wasn't even something objective or neutral, and yet they did not want to participate. The third study was in the military sector, and this was very interesting. Um, the guy I worked with 
uh, they're by the way they're all adults doing university degrees in evening school uh, so that's why they are also full-time lawyers or uh, soldiers in the military um, you give away a lot of your data and a lot of things are tracked to do soldier profiling and they do that to assign you to the most suited job and most suited geographical location around the world. Um, he did interviews, he did a qualitative study, and the general answer really was, I don't have a choice, do I? So because there is such a strong hierarchy in a military organization, they felt like they couldn't really say no to um, the use of algorithms on their data, and they didn't like that, so they didn't like algorithms. Lastly, um, we did a government project, actually with the tax office of an unnamed country, uh, where they have automatic selection of tax submissions that the computer de uh, detects as being a little bit suspicious, and then it needs to be checked by the human. Um, we had a roller coaster right there. Um, they said at first you can have the data, no problem. Then they said, no, you cannot have the data. And then they said, OK, you can have the data. And no, you can't have the data. That's where we're momentarily stuck at for the past eight months, just getting access to the data of the government. So access to good empirical data is another challenge. And I, I've used a bit of um, the Pixar movie to express the feelings associated with all these studies that we set up and that did not really succeed because we encountered so many problems. But what do we know? Um, we know that there is something called algorithm aversion and something called algorithm appreciation. I think we can all relate to algorithm aversion. Imagine that you're making a Word document and you are inserting a picture and everything is in your text jumping one way or another and it's not being logical at all or it gives errors that are not logical at all. We all have that moment where we want to take our laptop or our computer and just throw it out the window. Um, that is because we expect algorithms to be perfect. So we have a sort of perfection scheme in our mind um, that accounts for um, everything that is automated. Uh, we expect it to be behave uh, rationally and consistently and logically. We don't have the expectation of humans though. We know that humans are flawed, so we are much harsher towards algorithms. Now, algorithm appreciation has also be, uh, been found where people actually selected the algorithm as their preference. But the question is, are these two studies really comparable? And where they are comparable, are they not more the same than that they are different? Well, allow me to explain. So algorithm aversion essentially means that if you see an algorithm perform an error, which happens, I mean, the data isn't perfect, the data is noisy, your forecast will never be accurate. You will never have a 0% uh, error rate. But if we see those faulty performances, we are quick in abandoning the algorithm. And so in the setup of DeepForce, that led to a preference of judgment over a preference of the algorithm because they saw it make mistakes and they lost all trust. If you look at a paper on appreciation, they got a choice between algorithms and judgment, and they had algorithm as a main choice, so they liked algorithms, it's appreciation. But bear with me now, because you see that I've blanked out two things. That is the exact same thing that they found in the Deed Force paper, but in the Deed Force paper, it's sort of like a side note or maybe even just a footnote. Uh, initially, people were also given the choice between trusting an algorithm or trusting judgment, and they also indicated algorithm as a main choice. 
It is only after seeing it perform that we abandon it. Similarly, if we look at um, the appreciation paper by log, they also gave feedback after the choice was made, and there was more adjustment in the algorithm category than there was adjustment in the judgmental category. So if we kind of draw a comparison there, they were also harsher towards the algorithm because they were adopting it more than they were towards the judgmental choice. Um, even if they selected algorithms initially, they are still harsher towards the algorithm than the judgment. So if we compare bullet points, it's just a matter of focus, right? The aversion paper focuses on what happens if people get feedback about algorithms, while the appreciation paper looks at um, what is the choice. But they all have feed, they all have the same process essentially. Now there are some differences in it. First of all, in the aversion paper, people have to choose between their own judgment and that of a statistical model. Um, in the appreciation paper, they chose between someone else's judgment and um, the statistical model. The type of task also differed. So the algorithm version task was a bit more complex. It was a multiple Q prediction task. So given this many factors with this input, what be, would be your prediction? While in the appreciation paper, it was a simple estimation task. To give an example, um, they asked people, they showed people a picture of a person and they asked him, asked them um, to make either choose someone else's judgment on this or to use a statistical model on this. Um, it's not an, an, a difficult task, it's a simple estimation talk, uh, the, uh, task, how tall is someone? But those are two very different types of task and also own judgment versus others judgment can really make a difference. So we wondered what about forecasting tasks, the ones we so often work with, so like time series uh, tasks. So we performed an experiment and these are the things that we varied. So we had the name because we wanted to look at the whole terminology thing. Um, as either correctly labeled uh, as being a judgmental function or a statistical model, or wrongly labeled, where we got the exact same graphs, but in the legend we flipped the two words around. Then there was also a group that got no feedback, and a group that got feedback, but only in the first half of the trials, because we were curious if there would be a transfer effect from that feedback. Now what we found, it looked a bit like this. So the, um, the gray line is a sales history period that we, um, that we simulated. Then we have the statistical forecast, which was um, a simple exponential smoothing model. And then we had the judgmental forecast. And this was a, a pilot study that we did where we had people making 20 judgments per series um which is great that they wanted to do that and they've actually done it pretty well um so you see at the bottom of this graph there's a slider between judgmental forecast and statistical forecast people were asked to move the slider towards the end of their preference so um if you completely trust the judgmental forecast slide it all the way to the left vice versa for the statistical forecast. If you're somewhere in between, between neutral, between leaning towards judgmental, then you can indicate it by moving it just a bit towards the left. And that way we had values between zero and 100 that we could use um, to see their preference. After people had done that slider, we thought, well, let's make it explicit as well please indicate which model bears your preference. Um, that is a sim simple zero one variable, but we could compare it then with the slider value. And then 
in the feedback phase, the it would update with that, that green little line that you see, and it's called updated sales, so that they have feedback on which model performed best. So what did we find? First of all, we found an effect of the face. So for everyone, not just the feedback condition, but for everyone, it was displayed as um, nine trials, then a screen in between, and then the next nine trials. What we found is that in both cases, there is a preference for statistical forecast. So if you remember that slider, it went from zero to 100, which means that 50 is the midway point, which is indicated by the green line here. Between 50 and 100 is a preference for stats, and between 0 and 50 is a preference for judgment. And what we saw here is that overall, looking at all the conditions, people have generally of, um, are in favor of the statistical model, and it increases with time. So it increases in phase 2 versus phase 1. We also found an effect of feedback. Um, in the sense that if no feedback was given, there was trust in a statistical model. But if we gave feedback, it actually lowered. So they went to the midway point. It was like they weren't sure anymore. Um, we also had an effect of the label, as you can expect. Um, so it's been reverse coded in the data so to make it clear. When there was a correct label, there was um, a strong preference for the stat model. When it was a wrong label, people just got confused and they dropped and they stayed around the middle point. Interestingly, there is an interaction between these two, which explains it a bit more in detail. In the no feedback condition, whether it is the right label or the wrong label, people choose stats. That means that they were looking at the graphical display and not really at the terminology of what is what. Um, however, if feedback was given, the preference for the statistical model flipped completely with the preference of the judgmental model. So there the label didn't matter. So if you get performance feedback, it is important to have the right name. And then, of course, there is the joy of a three way interaction, and that it takes everything into account, filters everything for its sole effects of those three variables. And I've tried to um, make a structured way of showing this because I always find it kind of hard. So we have again the green line. And the blue bars are the no feedback condition and the orange bars the feedback condition. Then you have phase one, wrong label, correct label, phase two, wrong label, correct label. Now, if you notice, is that almost everything is above the statistical preference, above the middle line, only in two cases, and those are both of the wrong label cases, um, is there a preference for judgment? So to conclude, overall, we find that there is a preference for statistical forecasts, except when the wrong label is combined with giving feedback. So that seems to just confuse people basically uh, to as what is going on. So, and, and it's a bit weird, but from that Pixar movie that I showed those four mean frustrated and angry characters, there's only one positive character. There's four negative characters. What are we teaching our kids? I don't have any, so I don't know. Uh, anyway, we were happy. Preference for statistical models. Um, that preference even increases over phases. The wrong label still leads to a preference for the stat forecast, except when there's a combination of feedback and a wrong label, then it seems that they confuse them because there is then not really a preference. The difference with the middle point wasn't, um, wasn't significant. 
So if we go to our overview list of all the specific aspects, the blue stars or whatever you want to call them are the people we investigated. So for cost of profiles, we used a simple model. We looked at statistical models. We framed it in a sales context. Then remember the gray line was sales figures. And we looked at preference as a sort of precursor for trust, as a precursor for intention to use. As you can see, a lot is left, which is good news for us because we've got a lot left to do. Um, but it is also an explanation on to why we can't give a simple answer to a difficult question, such as do practitioners trust algorithms? So if you came here to receive an answer for that question, I apologize. I may have confused you more, uh, but I just want to show that um, it is multifactored, it is complex, everything interacts. It's not that easy. Um, if you have any questions, remarks or uh, ideas, I'm happy to follow up also with the discussant. Well, thank you, Shari. That's uh, very interesting. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, a, a challenging, important subject. And now over to Paul, who may offer us a simple answer. Who knows? Paul. OK, well, well, thank you very much, Shari, for a, a most interesting and clear presentation and findings. Uh, I haven't got any simple answers anyway, but I've got a few points which hopefully will be of interest. And uh, certainly given the increasing role of algorithms in our lives, uh, I think these issues are becoming much more important and worthy of investigation. Now, I think our primary focus here is on forecasting, specifically prop time series forecasting. So we're not primarily concerned with whether people prefer algorithms to fly a plane or provide movie recommendations or medical diagnosis or to navigate their car. Uh, in these some of these cases, there are some startling examples of algorithm appreciation or so-called automation bias. Uh, for example, I used to talk about a, a, a motorist who in 1998, despite the evidence of his own eyes, he drove his car into the river Havel in Germany uh, because his sat-nav told him wrongly that a bridge was over the river. The bridge hadn't yet been built. Uh, he, he had a choice between the algorithm and his own judgment, and he trusted the algorithm and uh, got a bit wet as a result. Now, the paper by Log et al., which uh, you referred to, uh, the, the title of that is Algorithm Appreciation. People prefer algorithmic to human judgment. And that implies to me that uh, people universally prefer algorithms, uh, regardless of their individual characteristics, for example, whether they're statistically trained or not, uh, the, and the context and nature of their decision. And as you said very eloquently, Shari, uh, this is very complex and much depends upon those variables and other ones. So surely uh, it can't be universal that people prefer algorithms to human judgment. And I think time series forecasting is a concept where a context where algorithm aversion is common, though, as your experiment suggests, again, we can't make that universal claim. So, so what's the evidence for algorithm aversion in uh, time series forecasting? You referred to some of this. Um, well, first of all, managers in organisations, as we know, frequently adjust their algorithm based time series forecasts, sometimes 90 percent, even 100 percent I've heard recently of forecasts coming from an algorithm or adjusting. That's from a major software company. Um, and, and an experiment I conducted with Dilek Onkel and others, uh, which I think you, you know about, we found that people adjust the same forecast more if they think it comes from an algorithm uh, rather than from a human advisor. Now, again, as you've alluded to this, Shari, the, the distinguishing feature of time series forecasts is that they are subject to noise and hence a perception of inadequacy, a wrong, a wrong perception of inadequacy in many cases it, it, as to the source of the advice forecast. And again, as you pointed out, as Diet Vorst argues, people are less tolerant of perceived errors emerging from an algorithm than they are from humans. Now, as far as I can see, none of the experiments in the Log et al study which suggests algorithm appreciation, provided long run track records of the human or algorithm. Uh, as such, 
they're only dealing with what I call presumed, presumed credibility as opposed to revealed credibility. People make assumptions not having seen the track record of the algorithm. Now, in time series forecasting, I think revealed accuracy is likely to be crucial in determining trust. And I note uh, in your last experiment, Shai, that you did provide a track record implicitly uh, by showing how the past forecasts have performed uh, on the graph. And you also provided feedback, of course. Now, this interaction between presumed credibility, which generates expectations about performance, and revealed credibility of the track record, I think is crucial. Uh, hence the importance of feedback and so on. In this vein, we've been conducting recent interviews with uh, forecasters around the world, we being Photius, Petropolis and myself. And a lot of the interviewees suggested that managers often buy algorithm based forecasting software on the basis of glitzy sales pitches that promise near perfect forecast accuracy. Some senior managers apparently even expect 100% forecasting accuracy. So their presumed credibility is high. When inevitably this fails to happen, and of course the forecast inevitably have errors, as they should if they're only forecasting the signal, uh, their expectations are dashed and they revert to a total distrust of algorithms. And that tends to match Diet Voss's uh, hypothesis in many ways. F finally, and I've got a couple of questions for you in a, in a moment, uh, Shari. Despite this, I think there's at least one reason why in some cases people or forecasters might prefer algorithms. And that's because they can blame them for inaccurate forecasts. And it's often easier to blame an algorithm than a colleague. That damn software's let us down again. You might not like to say that to a colleague who's provided you with forecasting advice. And there are many cases in other contexts where people act on advice they know to be unreliable because the advice absolves them of blame and responsibility for any subsequent poor decisions. But I think this business of presumed credibility and uh, revealed credibility is quite a, an interesting dimension for this. So on the base of that, uh, just a couple of questions about your um, um, uh, experiment, if, if I may. Um, how was the source of the judgmental forecast frame? Did, I mean, for example, did you say this is an expert uh, who's provided these forecasts, which might have enhanced presumed credibility? And what was the form of the feedback you gave, which will have presumably give them some notion of how reliable the algorithm versus the judgment was? So could you just give us a bit more information on that, please? OK, so the people that we asked or as is so often nowadays was via crowd, crowdsourcing platform. And we gave them a story beforehand, like imagine you are a forecaster. Um, now, I have had a study where we had both experts and forecasters. And what we found was that experts did a little bit better then, so people who do it as their daily job did a little bit better than the uh, crowdsource example, um, but they all displayed the same biases. So they all displayed over optimism, anchoring, trend damping, whatever you want. Um, so in, in that sense, um, well, we turn to crowdsourcing platforms because it's also very hard to reach the actual forecasting experts. Um, then the form of feedback was, and I'll go back to the slide, it was simple <coughs> visual feedback, um, not explicit. So that's shown here at the end. Uh, once they clicked their preference, they got a green little arrow and dot. Now, in this case, it's actually a very close call, but in some, it was very different for both the judgmental and the statistical model if there was an outlier. Um, that's the random data. Uh, I, I now know that when I started in the field of forecasting, because my background is in behavioral science, when I started in the field of forecasting, my very first teacher in my very first class said, be ready to be wrong for the rest of your lives. Um, a forecast is never 100% and that's an irrealistic expectation. But people don't handle uncertainty well um, and we expect the statistical model to be perfect. 
Now, uh, if we would, it would be interesting to look, for instance, into acceptance of probability forecasts, which are more accurate, but more difficult to, which can be seen as, you know, having more accurate results or being better calibrated. Um, wait, I lost my train of thought. Oh, with, with point forecasting, because a point forecast uh, indicates security. This will be the answer. People like security uh, and they're like, OK, the computer says this is the answer, so this will be the answer. And then they have a mistake because of the noise in the data. That is actually not a mistake, but they see it as such. And they are quickly, you know, hands off saying, no, this is not a good model, especially when we're trying to introduce something new that is complex or even something, a simple method that is um, new to the people. Um, people are very hesitant about using it. They, if they don't understand it in full, if it's not transparent, um, if you start with machine learning methods, um, it's a black box entirely. Uh, I, in a conversation that I got into with LinkedIn about how forecasting wasn't making progress, the argument was that we know so much about machi machine learning, yet that is not what we are implementing via the vendors in companies. And then I said, yes, but I've talked with vendors and it is the companies, it is the forecasters that don't want it because they don't understand the model. So they have a test run with it and they just don't know what is going on. So unless you are a big company and I'm thinking uh, Google and Amazon um, where they have massive budget and of a separate forecasting team, you can have experts there in the more complex metals, uh, methods such as machine learning. Um, so it's kind of a question between do we go for accuracy or do we go for preference and acceptability? I don't know if that answers your uh, yeah. question. Uh, just, just one more comment and then obviously other people can ask questions. In conducting these interviews with forecasters, um, uh, two interesting suggestions were made. Where the statistical model gives us a straight line horizontal forecast, as arguably it should if there's random data, uh, one of our interviewees suggested that you should artificially introduce some random perturbations to make the forecast list acceptable. In a similar vein, we know that people don't like very wide prediction intervals. They don't trust them, they discount them. So somebody again suggests you that you should, inverted commas dishonestly, present a narrower prediction interval than is correct. At least then people are more likely to take recognize that some uncertainty associated with the forecast, even though strictly speaking, you're presenting a dishonest um, uh, version of the true level of uncertainty they're facing. So uh, given your uh, comment there about the trade off between accuracy um, and acceptability, uh, those two devices uh, might be worth exploring, I think. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I just want to say that replication of noise is one of the other biases um, we uh, we published about in that experts and um, novices paper and it is something that I have been using in class as well so I hand out exercise sheets beforehand and it's quite funny how people continue to do that so I generate series with a certain level of noise low noise medium noise high noise but all with the same signal just a simple straightforward either um, upward or downward or flat regression line and People, when asked when asked to make the next five forecasts, they don't follow that line. What they do is, is, is like you said, um, they will basically replicate the noise. But that is not logical because noise is noise and it's not predictable. That's the reason you should follow the signal. But it is a very typical mistake. And I've done that in, in several classes, I think in total with over 100 people, and there was not one person who did the straight line thing. They all started replicating the noise patterns. <laughs> um, it's of course, it's great if an exercise like that works in class. Um, and yes, 
that's again a sign of uncertainty, saying we would prefer smaller intervals to wider intervals. But there again, smaller intervals have the risk of not including, including the actual value, which is again an error, which will again lead to distrust. So it's, it's the uncertainty of people and the uncomfortableness with this combined with um, things like replicating noise and the specific biases that make it all quite hard to to look into. We've got uh, one or two questions that are really on the same sort of theme, um, which are concerned with uh, in, improving, increasing trust in models. Uh, you've made the point that uh, models typically eliminate noise, so well, <laughs> one way of increasing uh, trust and decreasing accuracy is to add noise in. Uh, but there are other features, and so somebody asked about uh, what's the pushback from the various stakeholders uh, to uh, accepting a particular model. Uh, you know, we find ourselves in a situation where at least even in demand planning, never mind some of the other areas that Paul mentioned, um, the, um, the, there is a, a strong impetus towards uh, machine learning models, for example, which are often pretty opaque and complicated. So what's your thinking? What would increase trust in uh, algorithms and particularly these complex algorithms which are uh, coming our way now? Well, there have been a number of papers on increasing trust and one of them uh, was from the, the healthcare field um, where doctors have uh, automated medical diagnosis of you know outliers of lung scans a machine selects like this policy is suspicious and what they said there was that you can gain the acceptance of the algorithm and the trust by having people design it along with you um, to have them involved from the start and to make it really transparent what it's doing. Um, now, that is what the vendors does aim to do because they want to meet the need of their clients. And it kind of depends on who the client is, who they're talking to, because management may say, well, machine learning and 1% improvement that's an immense cost saving or that's immense extra profit post machine learning is hype and we should be where the hype is i mean technology is evolving ever faster so we got to keep up while the user of the forecast might just focus on how does this model work and if we can involve them in a very close way um, as is being done in our field um, in the design of the forecast model or to give more explanation about the principles of machine learning, that might help. So what we really want to do, and this is my psychological background speaking, is we want to reduce that uncertainty that is associated with innovation, with new things and with complex things by being transparent and having them involved. I think that's where the most avenue for improvement is. Thanks, Sherry. Let, let me just finish off then, since we're running out of time, with a question to both you and Paul. A very broad question. You've already touched on one element of it. What in your experience are the most common errors? Well, you've already mentioned adding noise to the situation. What are other, are the common error, uh, errors that you see, uh, Sherry and Paul? Well, um, one I see a lot is over optimism. So people doing um, upwards adjustments. Uh, I have seen that in especially in project management, but also in um, supply chain forecasting. Um, there is there are several biases, you know, taking too much value of that last data point. For instance, uh, the slide that is presented here it's clearly a downward trend here, um, but there is one up. So people tend to use that last data point as an anchor 
for their next one. They're not going to put it here, which would be actually sensible if this would be a continuous um, drop. Um, there are many other biases. Too much to discuss here because I can't talk about this for hours. <laughs> but I think the one that is the most important, especially in the context of accepting algorithms, is the tinkering effects that you mentioned in your uh, paper, Robert, from 2009. Um, and uh, also the illusion of control effects. Um, they're both the same. It's the fact that forecasters make um, small adjustments to the forecast model output um, for a variety of reasons. Um, they want to play their role. They want to be their role. I mean, if you just have to press a, press a button and accept the forecast output, then who are you? People seek feedback about their performance. Um, so there again, they are just performing for the sake of performance and adjusting to let people know, hey, look, I am valuable here uh, and I'm doing my work. But the problem is, <laughs> so. The problem is that those are adjustments uh, usually not based on extra knowledge people have, but on the bias of illusion of control and just wanting to shift it a little bit up or a little bit down, but it generally harms accuracy. And Paul, final comment? Yes, the I think in addition to what Shari said, and I agree with all of what she's just said, I think the confusion of forecasts with targets, budgets, plans, decisions is a major reason why people adjust uh, the forecast from algorithms. But worse still, they often don't adjust the output of algorithms. They get inside them, play around with the parameters until they get the forecast uh, they want uh, or, the, or the value they want. And then they blame the algorithm if that forecast is inaccurate, despite having uh, manipulated and fiddled it to meet what they always want. And I think that's uh, uh, quite a common experience that, that we've seen. Uh, so I think uh, um, actually separating the forecast from all these other things like targets and decisions and so on is, is something that uh, needs to be done much more widely. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you very much, Shari, for putting a, a very interesting <coughs> presentation with so many issues which are essentially unresolved. and. Uh, we all hope from the centre to see you at the uh, it's the 14th of January meeting, I think. Uh, oh, so ple okay. please keep an eye on that next meeting. Good. Goodbye and uh, all the best for the new year. Same to you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. See you all. Bye.